Thank you, everything. Um, I know Chelsea's welcomed you all a number of times. I'd like to welcome you all again. Some familiar faces up here. All right. I saw Dale Dials down there. John Stern's on here. Uh, Kang from Solaris. Nice to see you, man. Um, yeah, it's great. Great. Thanks for having you guys all out. Um, actually, I only fit like 25 names on my, 30 names on my screen. So there's a bunch of you that I know are here. Matt, I saw you signed in. Hi, Matt. Um, yeah, thanks for coming to join us. Um, we, I see we got a number of people popping in. So uh, I will spend a minute talking a little bit about kind of how we've been doing this. Um, we've been uh, trying to promote this idea of doing online webinars and educational experiences for our clients and our potential clients. I think I'm the one who should shut his phone off. There we go. Um, and so we've been doing this just to try to get the word out and get people understanding a little bit more about technology that's available now and the opportunities that are out there uh, for optimization, especially for uh, facilities that are in you know, a bit of a difficult time, oil prices are down. And so um, one of the technologies that we've been promoting a lot throughout this is uh, JP3's Virox technology. Hey, Bill, how you doing, man? Good beard. That's coming in. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, and so we've been promoting JP3's Virox technology because it provides a unique way to do some of the measurements that we've been doing traditionally with other types of analyzers and being able to pull this in in a methodology now that's easier to install, lower maintenance, and has a number of advantages. Nice to see you, Garth. Um, okay, so. Let me actually get a slide up here. So we're going to talk about the Virox and kind of how it fits into facilities. Kind of my agenda for this is we're going to start a little bit about who Insight is and then launch a lot and what we do for systems integration. But the majority of this talk is going to be about uh, JP3 and their use of near infrared spectroscopy. Just to back up a second. It's kind of interesting for me because the way Insight began was really through meeting JP3. I've been a consultant. I Chelsea had mentioned you know, my backgrounds in physics and chemistry, and I'm kind of a science nerd, spectroscopy guy. And I've been consulting uh, for a long time and met the folks at JP3. And actually, Matt, who's on here, was one of the first people I met. And we started having a discussion about this technology that they had. And I started seeing the applications they were going to do. And they're down in Austin, Texas. And I'm telling them, well, how are we going to get this up into Canada? And of course, in Canada, we have some different requirements for electrical safety codes, for pressure vessel safety codes. And so it became an opportunity to take that relationship that really began as a consulting thing and move it into the opportunity to help to bring this technology up to Canada and get it into some of our local facilities. So really JP3 kind of led to the birth, if you like, of Insight. So Insight began really saying, we're gonna take this technology and bring it to market. We worked for a long time with companies like Fleur and in Canada at the time to, um, to get this technology accepted into some first facilities. And that's kind of where we began from. What we are now is a Calgary-based systems integrator and distributor of products, carry a number of different product lines. We operate out of a 20,000 square foot uh, facility. We have big bay doors, 10 ton overhead crane that we can pull a full analyzer building in on, do complete systems integration here. For the Canadians, we're AB83 compliant, which means that we can build products that are certified as for use in pressure applications, CRN numbers, We've done projects for CRNs for Alberta, BC, Ontario, Saskatchewan. A bunch of this came from this Western research background, and we've been doing a lot of systems integration there. So I have a manufacturing engineer who does a fantastic job on our documentation. I have a great draftsman who's been around for a long time in the industry, about 35 years, just doing analyzer projects. And so we bring a lot of these resources together to be able to do full projects for people. All of our electrical is done by journeyman electricians. We do full factory uh, acceptance tests here in Calgary. On the systems integration side, we'll do everything from small panels, uh, like a little regulator panel, to an oxygen analyzer for oxygen and dissolved water, to um, composite samplers for crude and uh, condensate pipelines, 
to everything we do, we try to make it be as operator friendly as we can. So we'll do things like you see here in color code valve handles. So when we write instructions, we can say, hey, this is how you're gonna actually make this thing work and use this and make it easier to work on for operators and for people who are gonna use it. We'll uh, do full systems. This is a JP3 uh, near infrared analyzer sitting in the middle here on a crude blending skid. So there's crude oil flowing through the pipe here and they're determining, they're measuring vapor pressure with this near infrared device and determining how much butane they can push into that crude. Um, butane's obviously inexpensive compared to the price of crude. So there's a big advantage if we can blend some butane in. So yeah, and then there's, you know, like I say, full analyzer buildings to, you know, automated sampling panels, again, with one of the JP3 infrareds in there. Uh, again, you know, you can see this is, there's a lot of tubing and piping that goes on in these systems. Same with any very analyzer system. But what we're going to talk about with the JP3 stuff is how a lot of this is simplified compared to when we look at putting in something like a chromatograph or an online vapor pressure analyzer. Um, again, you know, full analyzer buildings. This is one of my favorite pictures. Doug's on here. And Doug took this one at one of our installations. And it's a beauty because you can see we've got a couple of composite samplers sitting here over here on the side. We've got a JP3 infrared in here. We've got automated grab sampling going on with a full PLC control. We've got an automated solvent plot flush. A lot of the times these condensate systems are waxy. And Thank so you. we want to be able to flush all that wax out of there. Um, yeah. Tell us, could you mute? Thanks. Um, so, a big part of this is, is, again, is trying to figure out how we can provide a full system solution to these sorts of things. Um, and the, the infrared part fits into there because it gives us the analytical tool. And then we put around it the things that we need to do to make an integrated system that meets all the requirements of a client, whether it's custody transfer requirements with composite sampling or other, other parts of the, uh, the installation. So now we're going to talk a little bit about this spectroscopy side of things. Jorge Gamboa, my God, it's been a long time, man. <laughs> um, absorbance spectroscopy is what we use here. So we look at how much light gets taken away. So when we think about this with visible light, we think of visible light going from you know, blue to red, and those correspond to different wavelengths of light. And if we have white light like we have in this room, all of those different colors are there and it looks white to us. When we put something like green food coloring in there, what it does is it attenuates the red and it attenuates the blue. It takes those away and it lets the green go through. We actually couldn't measure how green this sample was by only measuring the green. This clear glass or bottle of water would let through as much green light as a green food coloring sample would because it doesn't absorb in the green and neither does a green food coloring. We measure how green it is by how much red and how much blue it takes away. So in absorbance spectroscopy, what we look for is what colors of light got taken away, how much of them got taken away, and that lets us identify what's there. So in this case, we're doing the visible, kind of a really common thing that we're all, you know, we're all familiar with, easy to experience. The near infrared region of the spectrum. So if we start out with that blue to red region, over here is red, this is about 800 nanometers for a wavelength of light. If we take that now and we start to move the wavelength further beyond the red, we go into a region that we refer to as the infrared, beyond the red. And there's some really interesting things that go on now. When we talk to clients and we tell them, we're going to measure the vapor pressure of your crude oil by shooting a beam of light through it. The first thing they say to us is, you're not going to get a beam of light through my crude oil. Have you ever seen my crude? You're not getting light through that. You know, this isn't a crude, this is a condensate. Just a second. Um, this is a condensate, and you can see how dark it is. 
And you can see that people are going to say, well, I really... No worries. Guys, this is what I was telling you about. If you haven't used Zoom before, just to note that you can actually close, you can get a little bit of a close-up view on this if you use that toggle. It's running down your screen. Sorry, Phil. Thanks. No worries. Thanks, Charles. So you can see that it's going to be difficult. Or people would think, well, it's going to be difficult to let light, for light to get through there because it's so dark. And it's true. And this black line that's on this graph is showing how much of the light is absorbed or taken away by something like crude oil. And so the fact that it's so dark is because it takes away a lot of the visible light. But when we move beyond that part of the spectrum, as we move beyond the red and into the infrared, suddenly the light starts to be, it doesn't get absorbed as much. It starts to move right through the sample. And we start to move further and further into longer wavelengths. We get out past 1,200 nanometers, and suddenly we get out here, and the hydrocarbons start to absorb. And not only do they start to absorb light, but each one of those hydrocarbons absorbs that light slightly differently. And so from a, a chemist's perspective, we talk about it that each one of these hydrocarbons has like a fingerprint to it, and that by looking at the shape of that absorbance spectrum, we can figure out which hydrocarbons are there. And by looking at how strongly it absorbed the light, we can figure out how much of them are there. So how much light got taken away tells us how much. The shape that it gets absorbed by helps us to figure out which ones are there. None of this is new. Um, People have been doing this in refineries for uh, gasoline branding for decades. They've been doing it on spectrometers that have lots of moving parts. They're very complex. They require a lot of maintenance, but refineries have lots of technicians. Really easy to maintain something in a refinery. I got 20 or 30 trade analyzer techs around. I can put that technology in a refinery and it works. But now I want to take that same capabilities, that same type of technology, and I want to put it up in Fox Creek, Alberta. I want to put it someplace that's difficult to get to, doesn't have a dedicated analyzer technician, there's nobody around to maintain it, and I want it to run 24-7, 365, with as little maintenance as possible. Now I have to change how I do my spectroscopy. And this is what JP3 really did, is they changed how they did their spectroscopy, they changed how they did their number crunching, and then they said, well, let's make it robust so it can go out in the field. So I wanna talk a little bit about kind of the technological shifts that had to happen to bring this so we could put it onto a nasty crude oil out in the middle of Fox Creek, Alberta, or out by Dawson Creek, and make measurements. So one of the first things that had to happen was we had to have a really stable light source. We had to have a stable light source that was very repeatable, very reproducible, could be mass produced, and was going to give us the capabilities to do the measurement. And so there's a bunch of things that needed to come up in that technology. And really the telecom industry kind of pushed this first. Telecom guys wanted to have diode lasers. So they shoot data down fiber optics. And because they want to send data down fiber optics, they look for long mean times between failure, robust, reliable, repeatable devices. Then this whole thing came up, well, I can put more data down the fiber if I use different colors of lasers, a thing called wavelength division multiplexing. Push more data down there. So now I say, well, I'd like lasers that I can make at different wavelengths. Take that one step further and make a laser that you can tune. You can change which wavelength it's operating at and sweep it back and forth. And why is that important to us? If we go back and we look at um, the spectrum here, we see that the absorption changes at different wavelengths. And what we want to be able to do is take that laser and start here and make a measurement and then move that laser over to here and make a measurement and move that laser over here to make a measurement and then move it over here to make a measurement and keep that laser cha wavelength changing until we can scan that whole shape, pull all that information in, in one big piece, that whole spectrum now. So we take that, that tunable laser and um, 
we uh, change its wavelength. Chelsea, can you figure out whose mic that is? Yep. Thank you. We take the, um, I think it's Galaxy A10. We take that wavelength, we scan it across that spectrum, and that lets us make a measurement of multiple different colors of light. It gets us all that data in. So now we get all this data, we have to do something with it. And so when we're doing spectra on gasoline and things like that, it's pretty easy. Gasoline is a pretty stable product. When we want to do more complex products, else could you mute them again? Galaxy A10. Can I, is it, is, Whoever that is, are they trying to ask, if you're trying to ask a question, can you just private message me, please? Otherwise, I'm just going to keep you on mute, love. Thanks. Um, so we get all that data, and now we have to do something with it. And so what the other piece that really needed to come along is we need to be able to process a lot of data and process it fast. And there's been huge advances, you know, that people talk about computing speed, doubling at a you know, whatever the rate is, I can't remember the numbers people talk about, computers get faster and faster. But also we developed a lot of really sophisticated algorithms. We developed these algorithms so that we could detect patterns and shapes and things like people's faces to do face recognition on phones in the waveforms that come in when we talk. You know, at one time people who did studied artificial intelligence said, I don't know if we'll ever get the technology good enough that we can, um, fully recognize human speech. Kids' toys do it now. Cheapest phone does it now. And it's because we've gotten better with all of these algorithms that we use to pull actionable data out of complex waveforms. So now we take that and we apply that to chemistry. We start taking that pattern analysis capability and we apply it to chemistry. We measure those spectra and we use that data to evaluate things like chemical compositions and physical properties. So we take that spectral data, run it through this number crunching routine, and boom, we get actionable numbers out of it. The next slide is animated. It's gonna change uh, on its own a little bit, and it just shows you some spectra for some of these infrared, for some of these components in the infrared. So the top one up here is a natural gas liquid, a, a C2, C3 stream um, at about 420 pounds. The bottom one here is pure propane you can clearly see how you could differentiate by the naked eye the difference between propane and that NGL stream. The top one just changed to butane. It looks different than the propane. Bottom one just went to isobutane. It looks different than n-butane. Top one went to a C5 plus stream. They have different spectral shapes. There's all this information in there. What we need is that computing capability to pull that information out. So now if we've got that computing capability and we've got this advanced spectrometer that can get the data, we still have to worry about some things. Because all that works really great. In a traditional analyzer, we have these requirements for an analyzer that we want this nice clean stream that we're gonna measure in. This is another natural gas condensate. So this is a C5 plus stream. People call it condensate. Coming off the bottom of a debutanizer. Beautiful, crystal clear. Nathan's on here. He used some of the stuff to run his lawnmower. It's so nice and clean that even an engine's okay with it. So this is condensate. This is condensate. This is the stuff that comes back from the US on the coach and pipeline. This is condensate. Kind of dirty and schmeggy looking. This is condensate off of the CRW pipeline. Or, um, yeah, CRW. And so when we start getting samples like this, they become really difficult to put through traditional analyzers. Put this in a chromatograph, put this in a conventional vapor pressure analyzer, and all that small tubing wants to plug up. So now we have to think of a better way of doing sampling as well. So part of that came down to how are we going to build a flow cell that we can do this in? So the JP3 uses what they refer to as the virocyte cell. 
This whole thing is made out of 316 stainless steel. CRN, so a pressure rating to 1500 PSI, means we can go on a 600 pound ANSI class system. So we can do all that without any pressure protection. Half inch ports. You know, not like a GC or something like that that has a little eighth inch tubing. We've got half inch ports on this thing. That fluid's gonna flow through. Inside there, we put these synthetic sapphire rods. We use sapphire because it is the second hardest thing next to diamond. So there's a synthetic sapphire core, crystal clear, machined, second hardest thing next to diamond, won't get scratched by sand, clay, or bitumen. We take those and we put them inside of a block, that block of stainless steel, and now we have a flow cell. Our process fluid can flow up in between those two. My pen's just the right size. Our process fluid can flow up between those two sapphire rods, and we shoot a beam of light in from one side through that process fluid, collect it on the other side, and take it back over fiber optic. So now the only thing that's touching process fluid is these half-inch ports, stainless steel, synthetic sapphire, doesn't scratch, doesn't get attacked by H2S, doesn't get attacked by saline solutions, all those sorts of things. So now we've got the cell that's very mechanically robust, large ports. We allow that process fluid to flow in, in between the sapphire rods, and we shoot a beam of light across them. When the beam of light goes through, that absorption thing happens. It processes that fluid. Take, it, it processes the information, if you like. The light goes through there and it gathers information about the fluid by having some of its wavelengths taken away. Now we just have to bring that back to a spectrometer that can figure out what that meant. So this enables us to change how an installation looks. Traditionally, when we put in an online analyzer, we put an analyzer building in, we bring process fluid over the analyzer building in. Because we're bringing fluids that contain you know, potentially H2S, they're combustible, all those things. We put all sorts of protection in a life support system around the analyzer. We want to change all that. What we want to do is look for some source of differential pressure. This could be an orifice plate, could be a pump, could be a control valve. We have some source of differential pressure. Assuming our direction of flow is going here, the high pressure is on this side, pushes through some half inch tubing or pipe and returns right back to the process. So no pumps, nothing in our transport system that we're gonna have to do maintenance on. Flow through nice large diameter tubing, flow through that flow cell, return back to the process. Because we can connect to the analyzer by fiber optic, we can take the brain, this is where the spectrometer is, and the thing that's gonna do all that number crunching, we can put it anywhere in the facility. MCC building, control room, blending skid operations, anything like that, we put the brains over there. We shoot a beam of light out over fiber optic, shoot it through that flow cell, bring it back into the analyzer. The spectrometer, this brings the information back in, so now the brain gets to process it. It says, I'm gonna measure the spectrum. From that measured spectrum, I'm going to run it through those sophisticated mathematical algorithms, and I'm going to decide, oh, I'm going to tell you the C1 through C6 chemical composition, or the C1 through C9 plus, or the vapor pressure, or the cloud point, or the initial boiling point. We can do all kinds of physical properties and chemical composition analysis based on what this infrared spectrum tells us. The really cool thing is, that we can do this fast. Typically about 30 seconds to do a complete measurement. That's the time to shoot the beam of light across the sample, get all the numbers, crunch them through all of our sophisticated algorithms, and spit out a new output. Anywhere from 15 to 30 seconds. So that means that we can get data fast. This lets us tighten up process control. Since we can do it fast, we can also decide to do it in multiple places. So we could be up here and we might be measuring our natural gas condensate over here. And we might decide, well, I'm gonna just take a second set of fibers, 
And I'm going to go out to this guy over here. And I'm going to make a completely different measurement. I could measure my inlet gas composition of my plant. This could be a crude oil blending application. They're completely, every measurement point is completely separate. A completely separate set of analysis can be done. So it's not like the case where I say, well, I've got a chromatograph here and it can measure NGL. It can do a C3 stream and it can do a C2 stream, but it can't do a C9 stream. I need different columns and detectors. We can have every measurement point doing a different measurement now. This means when we go into a plant, we can do measurements right across the whole facility. In fact, this analyzer comes in four, three different flavors. We can do a single point, which we'd like to do for something like a blending skid. We can do four measurement points. So we might have a deethanizer, debutanizer, plant inlet, and truck offload. Or we can do up to eight measurement points, which we might see in a really large plant or a large frack train or a plant that has multiple trains running. Installations look really easy now. From a PNID perspective, it looks really simple. We have a sample point, probably a double block and bleed valve. We come in, we usually go past a flow switch. We like to know if we have flow to the analyzer, flow through the infrared cell. This is a pressure and a temperature transmitter. Return back to process. No pumps, no filters, no regulators, none of those things that are normally maintenance. Put that all inside of a heated box, because we're in Canada here. In the US, they put these outside. Literally, the first installation I saw was a eight inch pipe with this little Christmas tree hanging off of it that had a JP3 cell, a pressure and a temperature transmitter. Sitting outside, entire measurement. Here, you know, when we talk about minus 45C, well, we say, oh, that's, we're gonna put a box around this thing. So we put that into a box. We send fibers out from the analyzer that we mounted over someplace like an MCC building, and we bring analogs and digitals back. So information comes back, tells us how's the health of the box. Analyzer shoots the laser out, gets data coming back. It's a little crude oil blending skid in the South Saskatchewan. Plant nearby has depropanizer bottoms that they truck away. Don't get very much money for deprop bottoms in South Saskatchewan. These guys have crude oil that's low vapor pressure, lower than the vapor pressure spec of the pipeline they're going into. So they say, why don't we take your deprop bottoms, blend them into our crude oil, sell deprop bottoms as if it was crude oil, make all that margin on the deprop bottoms, and now you don't have to truck it away. It was like they had peanut butter and chocolate. And they said, let's just put those two together and it's all going to be better. And so this is what they did. And so now they blend deep probe bottoms in. So deep probe bottoms is a, like a C4, C5 plus stream. They blend that into the crude. They sell it as if it's crude, but they have to meet the vapor pressure spec for the pipeline. These guys... Um, these guys wanted to be able to do this, but they said, I don't have a guy out there to maintain this thing. I don't want to have to do any maintenance. So that's why they, they said, now I want to look at an alternative technology. This is one of our first installations in Canada. And this unit was running for nine months for one period of time, and we'd not heard anything from them, not, you know, at all. No information back from them. We kind of were starting to wonder, well, are they really using the data or anything? And then on a Sunday, my service manager gets a phone call on a Sunday afternoon, and they say, hey, we just lost data communications to the analyzer. Can you, get out, can you figure out how we get back to talking because we can't blend without this thing? So nine months, no maintenance, nobody had even cleaned the cell windows. No sample system or unplug, no, no recovery tanks, minimizes the installation costs. Flow paths start to be real simple. This is at a deethanizer, I believe, and Basically, their sample tap is sitting right over here. There's a valve over here that's where they're sampling from. And it flows about whatever this is, maybe three meters over into that box and flows right back and returns to process. Really close. Again, we get really fast response. Inside this box is just like inside this box. Let me just see if I can zoom this for you. Sorry. Uh, there's one else. 
Beautiful. So you see there's a big black line coming in at the bottom. That's our crude oil coming in. Goes past that yellow flow switch. Flow goes up through the JP3 cell. It's got that little heating blanket over it. Keeps it warmer than the crude. That way no waxes or anything condenses on it. Comes past there, pressure temperature transmitter, return back into the blending building. Really short runs, really fast response times. When we start looking at things like chromatographs and we put them on liquids applications, these are the kind of things we start to see. First, we gotta figure out how are we getting the sample out of there. And if we're going into a vaporizer, we can have a big dead leg or slow response time sitting right at that sample point. If we vaporize it, we worry about can we vaporize the whole sample? Then we put coalescing and filtration into it, maybe a whole bunch of other sample conditioning stuff. And then we put it into this little GC oven that's so pretty and looks like it's really easy to work on. Of course, it's eighth inch tubing. We've got samples that have crude, uh, left crude oil that have sand, clay, bitumen, asphaltines in it, and we try to push it through sample systems like this. And we wonder why we have issues. You know, this is a really clean little GC oven. It's beautiful, but again, there's a lot of stuff going on in there. If we can make things simple, it becomes a lot more maintainable. We measure right at the process locations. So this cabinet is sitting right down here, and the debutinizer is sitting right in there behind it. So we have really close, do all of our measurements out near the sample point. Crude oil blending skid, this is what I showed in the other picture. Crude's flowing through this line, take a little slipstream of it through the cell. What's my vapor pressure? Oh, I can put more butane in. And that's all they wanna know. Am I, am I staying below my vapor pressure spec? Pipeline I say I have to be less than 95 kPa. I wanna, if I have to be less than 95, I wanna, wanna run at 94. I want to push as much butane into there as I can because I buy butane for five or ten dollars a barrel and I sell my crude for 30 or 40 a barrel and I make all that up on mar as margin. Then our condensate stabilizer. Box, you can see it's nice, it's a good screen, it's a little winter picture. So we got snow all around there, boxes mounted outside, heater inside the box, flow cell inside the box, flow switch. Do all our measurements out there. MCC building, they have an electrical building, no dedicated analyzer building. And so I don't have to build an analyzer shelter. I don't have to put in gas detection. I don't have to put safety systems in around that because no process fluid runs to the analyzer. They mount the analyzer on the wall of the MCC building, a little display on there so they can see what's going on, bring in the fibers, bring in their electrical, and there's nothing that goes back to this building. There's no process fluid there. So all that safety stuff we worry about, it doesn't have to be done. So, you know, typically when we think about putting conventional analyzers in, we think about buildings that look like this, big sample systems on the outside, process fluid is coming over there. There's probably fast loop pumps and all kinds of stuff. And that's what we think of for an analyzer installation. Instead, mount the analyzer on the wall or on a post inside of a metering building and say, there you go, I'm done. Put the panel outside, everything's complete. So if we look at some comparisons between things, I'm not gonna go into this in, lots, in tremendous depth, but with near infrared, we tend to measure close to the process. So that lets us get a speed of response in getting fluid over the analyzer. Chromatographs or physical properties analyzers, we us usually have to transfer it back over to where the analyzer building is. With the NIR, we measure everything at line pressures and temperatures. If it's single phase in the process pipe, it should be single phase in the analyzer. Conventional analyzers, we put in sample conditioning. Once we lower pressures or change temperatures, we run risks of phase changes. Lose bubbles in liquids, get liquids condensed out of gases. Those things happen our sample becomes biased. Flow everything through half inch tubing versus tiny tubing. Don't put any filters or regulators in. GCs will typically have redundant filtering stations. Filters plug. We tried to put a filter in one application just as a test. It lasted for about 15 minutes on the Condi that we were on. A lot of these filters will plug really quickly, and so that's why people have a tough time getting it to work. You know, we're gonna have about one minute response time. By the time we figure sampling and data processing, 
as compared to maybe 15 minutes or half an hour on a conventional analyzer. We can do multiple measurements with the NAR. We can measure composition and physical properties all off of a single measurement, not by an equation of state, not modeled physical properties. We actually can say, I'll build a model to measure the butane in the stream and to measure its vapor pressure, completely separate calculations, not dependent on each other. If we use a conventional chromatograph, physical properties all come down to the equation of state. Pick a different equation of state, you're gonna get a different number. We can mount the NIR anywhere as compared to putting in a dedicated analyzer building. Bill, the, sorry, may yes. I interrupt with a question? Sure, yeah. Okay. Uh, this is from Chris. Mm -hmm. Hi, Chelsea, I've got a question and a request. The question is how often do you need to recalibrate the model if the hydrocarbon you're blending changes? Okay. Is that Chris Cruz? Pardon? Was that Chris Cruz? Yes. Hey, Chris, how are you doing, man? Um, so yeah, so, it de so the question is, it depends. So what we try to do is get enough data to bracket the range of conditions that we see. So if we're, so if we're at something like a condensate stabilizer, we'll say run your stabilizer at different temperatures. That'll give us some low butane values, some high butane values, some intermediate butane values, and now we can build a model that covers across between there. These models tend to interpolate really well. The model out at that Saskatchewan facility has not been updated at least for 15 months. And they've told us, they sent us data saying, you guys are like within two KPA of our tester who comes out. So it really depends on how much variability there is. If you're gonna to try to do things like run different batches, run light sweet, heavy sour, heavy sour blended with Condi, heavy sour blended with butane, then we're gonna to have to build models around those different compositions. But if it's just like, oh, well, we changed which wells we're producing this week, the compositional change is probably covered within the scope of the model that's been built. Not only that, we just add new data in the model. So I like to tell people these things, they're like wine in a bottle. They get better and better and better over time. You let them age and things get, and keep on, keep them in good conditions and things just get better. Um, I know it's a little bit of a sales pitchy thing, but hey, it's, what we really know is that the more data we put into these models, the more robust they become. So if we add that data in, we can stretch the model out. A lot of our clients don't have an update of models in months and months, you know, and if they do what they want to, our guys go out, they don't have a couple of my service guys are here, go out, pull a few samples, add some data in and just, and it's like you're append, you're, you're appending the model. You're not at it. You're, you're not at it. You're adding new stuff to it. You're not building a whole new one. And um, I'm just going to add to that, Phil. If, I hope this is okay with Chris. I'm just going to let you know what the request is as well, just in case you want to speak to it. Um, can I get some references for, from upstream operators using this in Canada for plant processing and crude um, slash condi blending? Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, Scotty? I'll just, I can forward okay. this one to Scott or let Scott. Yeah, yeah just, Scotty, we'll, we'll take care of that. We'll get that to you afterwards, Chris, for sure. Right. Yep, for sure. Thank you. So the thing about some people like physical, well, physical properties analyzers, like vapor pressure analyzers, or things like chromatographs, is they, they're a more direct measurement to a lot of people. They're not relying on this idea of modeling. They're more built on a more direct measurement. And GCs and things like that can do very trace compounds, whereas normally we do more bulk constituents. Um, so there's kind of where the comparison sits in there. The big difference for me and for a lot of our clients on this comes down to the maintenance side of it. We have a client who said they spend $50,000 a year on parts to keep their chromatograph and their vapor pressure analyzer on condensate running. So just from a maintenance, and then there's maintenance labor on top of that. Uh, I'm running a little bit behind, so I'll maybe speed up a little bit. One of the big applications we've done is optimizing condensate stabilizers. So in Alberta here, there's a spec on how much butane or C4 minus you can have in your condensate. It's allowed to be 5%. And if you can optimize and run as close to that, you'll increase your production of condensate. That directly means you're producing more barrels. You're gonna reduce your energy consumption. You don't have to reheat the condi as much. 
that reduces the CO2 emissions so you don't have to give Justin Trudeau as much money in carbon taxes. So this is like a win for everyone now. Um, to do so, it requires real-time measurement of composition or vapor pressure. And a lot of people have had, found that online GCs have had issues here. Again, if you got a Condi that looks like this one, it may not be so difficult to get that GC running. But when you've got Condi that looks like this, and this is what plant bottoms looks like, if you think about how condensate's produced in a gas plant, inlet separator, drop the liquids to the bottom. Dirt, sand, clay, bitumen, those all go with the liquids. Take that liquids, put it in the condensate stabilizer. Dirt, sand, clay go to the bottom. That's what we're going to try to measure. Streams are dirty. They plug things off fast. Up in the Montany, where a lot of people are producing, those things are really waxy as well. So now we got to worry about wax formation as well. So, sorry, this is a really busy slide. There's probably too much info on here, and it's a bit redundant. But what we really want to do is measure how much C4 minus there is in our, our stabilized condi. This is basically methane, ethane, propane, and butane. We need those four measurements. We've got to keep that less than 5%. If we boil the stuff too hard and push a lot of that ethane, propane, butane over to the tops, we get less liquid out the bottom. So if we increase the heat, we push more gas out the top, and we get less liquid out of the bottom. Liquids are worth more money than gas. So what we want to do is reduce the amount of heat and make more of this product. But we can't go over 5%. If we go over 5%, we pay a penalty. So what we found with a lot of our clients is if we can put an analyzer in and optimize things, we can increase our volumetric production by 1% or 2%. Doesn't sound like much, right? I don't care if my, if my kid gets 99 on an exam or 98. I don't care about that 1% very much. This 1% means a lot, though. It means if you're producing 400 cubic meters a day, 1% more is 404 cubic meters a day. Cubic meter of Condi in Canada right now, prices are depressed, 250 bucks a cube. Four extra cubes, I did my math wrong. <laughs> That's $1,000 or $30,000 a month. So that 1% extra production there, even at current suppressed prices, can produce revenues of $30,000 a month just by optimizing that stabilizer. How do the numbers compare? You know, people always wonder, well, how do you do? And the big thing we have to compare it to is the lab. Remember, the lab is the guardian of custody transfer. If I have an analyzer and I say my product's good, and Scott's got an analyzer and he says my product's bad, we're never going to agree. The way we agree is we take a sample of the lab. So we want to see how it compares to the lab. These are three different condensate stabilizer trains, and you can see how the numbers look. Generally, we're in very close agreement all the way through. We have one data point here that's off by about a half a percent. And again, there's some variability in the lab and some variability in the analyzer. The cool thing about this installation was that when the customer bought it, they told us they wanted to measure butane and condi. When we got it on site, they said, we'd like to actually measure C1 from, from methane all the way out to C12s. We did that change with no change to the hardware. All we did was work with JP3, build bigger, stronger models that did more things, crunched more numbers, and gave him more outputs. At the same time, on this one, actually, we do vapor pressure as well. We do VPCR4 on this measurement as well. So one analyzer, no physical change in the hardware, and it goes from being a butane analyzer to measuring all of these things just by building stronger models. And that is another thing I think is one of the strengths of this technology is that if a new specification comes in, so you can say, well, can I model that specification? Oh, I used to just have to measure vapor pressure, and now they want to know cloud point. Oh, well, can I build a cloud point model? Can I add that in? All that stuff's potentially done on these sorts of applications. We do the same thing on deethanizers. Optimize. 
Adjust set points and temperatures. Decide which product you want to produce more. Gas is worth a lot of money today. I want to push more to the top. Gas isn't worth much money today. I want to push stuff to the bottom and hit specifications. By making measurements, we can control things. And what this technology does is let us make those measurements in the field with minimal maintenance. So truck loading, offloading application, we want to know the value of every truck. This truck is low in propane and has lots of yummy heavy stuff in it. Those goodies are worth a lot of money. So that truck has a lot more value. And so we can use this analyzer, we do a flow weighted average, get a data point every minute of what's coming off the truck, what the chemical composition is, flow weighted average of the truck, and now we can tell you that's what that truck was worth today. A couple of, another, just another example of some of the measurements we see. And you can clearly see the difference between some of these trucks, right? Like this one's really low in propane and got lots of heavy stuff. It's worth a lot of money. And so we use this to get real-time composition, real-time value off of trucks as they offload. Crude and condensate blending, again, we can, we can push in butane into crude and condensate. Butane's a low-value product. Crude or condensate are high-value products. We get to sell the cheap stuff as if it's good stuff. It's like watering down the whiskey in your bar. You take cheap stuff, put it in whiskey, sell it as if it's a shot, and you can just, it's just a license to print money by selling lower value products mixed with higher value products. Install base in Canada right now. I think this is reasonably up to date. Um, in Canada, Aventive um, was one of the early adopters. Tower was the first installation that we did within Canada. After that installation, in Canada has not put any other analyzer on a liquid stream in one of their gas plants. Every gas plant built since then has used this technology because they feel they get reliable results fast and minimal maintenance. Kiera, one of the early installations was at Joseph Berg Terminal, JBT. We ran for a year on a comparison test against an online GC and an online vapor pressure analyzer. And after that, when they did their intelligent quality product, they wanted to make sure they had tracking and understanding of the quality of the condensate all through their gathering system that comes into Fort Saskatchewan. We ended up on every one of those streams doing those measurements, as well up at the Simonet gas plant. Alta gas out at Hermatton, every stream of condensate at Hermatton is using this technology. Verison slash Pemina, uh, multiple installations on different types of applications. At Corona, the Corona Terminal in Ontario, we're measuring what they're offloading from trucks and rail to put to cavern or taking from cavern to sell out to customers on NGL streams. P Station, we're doing crude oil and vapor pressure. Height Gas Plant, we're doing a number of different NGL streams along with condensate. Trevita, Vermilion, Paramount are all crude oil blending. Um, very, again, so now you know, we're looking at different basins, right? Vermilion and North Portal is down in South Saskatchewan. We're up at Fox Creek. We're up by Green Court, White Court. I probably don't have these numbers right anymore. These I haven't updated. But in North America wide, there's over a couple hundred installations now. Every major basin, you know, if you look at it, we're in the, we're in the Bakken, the Montney, the Haynesville, the Permian, Right across North America, these, this technology is being used in every major basin right now. A great mixture of natural gas applications, NGLs, condensates, refined fuels, transmix and pipelines, wide base of applications. Briefly, I'm just gonna mention that a lot of times what we put in with these are automated samplers. We wanna be able to pull a sample. This goes to Chris's question. You know, what if my crude changes? I get a new crude come in. Um, maybe the analyzer doesn't like it, doesn't think it can measure it that well. We put automated samplers there, we pull a floating piston cylinder, say, okay, now you can fill the cylinder up, add data into your model really easily. From a custody transfer perspective, composite samplers as well, we provide a full line of composite samplers to go on in parallel with these. So now we're making online measurements for process control, composite samples for custody transfer. 
So you have an idea at the end, I just want to summarize a little bit about kind of us and what we do. So this slide's just anime, it's going to change on its own, but we'll work with you on everything from automated samplers to what's going to go on your pipeline, to composite samplers, to full NIR installations, full analyzer buildings and shelters. We will do the whole sample system, solvent flush systems, automate all the valving and sample poles, build a full system with Coriolis meters for the fast loops. Again, that little automated grab sampler in there. Then a composite sampler, and then this is my favorite. This is the one from Doug. I love seeing the inside of this building because it has so much of our gear in it. We've got an automated solvent flush system. So if this cell gets waxy, and they say, I don't, I'm not getting as much light to the cell, we push solvent through and flush it out and clean it. We've got automated samplers to pull samples. PLC that's going to control the whole thing. Fast loop running up top. Composite samplers, so we're getting product quality all the time. So in summary, um, Insight as a company, we believe, brings a strong measurement focus to applications in the oil and gas industry. We're all measurement guys. This is what we do. We're very Western Canadian centric right now. We like to work where we can support easily. Fantastic service uh, out of Grand Prairie. Okay service out of Edmonton. Hi, Doug. <laughs> uh, we're a service guy to Calgary as well. Um, no, I mean, we like to be where our products are and where we can service things. Um, we come with this. You know, fairly, uh, we have a strong sample system, shelter design group. We've been in this business for a long time, and we've been really grateful to have the opportunity to work with JP3. We got to bring this technology to Canada. We did the first ever installation in Canada, working with JP3, and uh, we've made this work up here, and people are happy with it. Oh, my screen behind me just went off. Let's fix that. A um, couple of thanks. Making measurements matter. Um, we put this together and we've been, this is a, now really a venue that if you're looking to host an event like this, we can help set all that up. Hopefully you found all that registration stuff and how this was, was uh, marketed to you and made available to you work really well. Um, Chelsea has obviously been doing the moderating for me here, but she's been instrumental in kind of building that and uh, works with people on branding businesses, on growing your business and basically building your own, whether it's a website or a business. And so uh, big thanks to her. It's been a huge help to this. Um, I'm going to leave this up here at the end. If you want more information, you can get it from our website. I guess I should have also probably put, you could also get it from www.jp3.com. Um, if you want to contact myself or Scotty, our contact information is up there right now. And um, we're trying to make our second quarter right now. So if there's an opportunity for there to pull a project in with you guys, um, we're probably willing to do some talking. And so this COVID thing has, of course, affected business, and we'd like to see something that we can, we can do to make this work. So that wraps me up. If there's any other questions, I'd be happy to take them. There is one more from Derek. Um, yep. Can JP3 uh, spe speciate a grouping? Speciate, yep. Can, that's right. Okay, good. Gave me. Um, can it break down a C4 group? Uh, can it break down a C4 grouping into butane, but, but, butene, etc.? What is minimum dedication limit for each co component? Comment for Phil. Okay, yeah. Yep. Um, yeah. So <laughs> it depends. Again, a lot of this stuff depends on the stream compositions. So, um, so what we want to measure in which stream? The butenes and the butanes, the alkenes and the alkanes separate really well spectroscopically. So doing things like separating one butene from a butane is actually a nice spectroscopic measurement to do. Detection limits depend on cell length and what all is there. Typically, we tell people that our detection limits are going to be down in that 1,000 parts per million, 0.1 LV percent is kind of typically detection limit, 0.1 to 0.3 LV percent. Lower than that in some applications, but that's kind of my, my rule of thumb number without seeing a stream composition I can work from. Again, we've got some JP3 guys on here. If anybody wants to jump in and correct me, you feel free, boys. Okay, Matt's in, good. Um, any other questions or anything? There's a comment after that from Derek who says, don't try mixing that water with whiskey where I live, at least not until after 2 a.m. <laughs> cool. Great advice.
Yeah. Thank you, Derek. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask a favor of a couple of people on here. I know we've got some um, Swage Lock guys and a couple of my guys here. We want to do a little test of something on Zoom. And so if you guys could hang out after this is done, um, I'll let you know, once we decide everybody is done, um, if you're a Swage Lock guy who wants to hang out or one of my guys who wants to hang out, put up your hand in the little participant thing, do the raise hand thing, and then Chelsea will know not to kick you out. Yes, um, otherwise, you're gonna probably get buttered at the end. Thank you, this is a bit of a favor for me, everybody, uh, presentation yeah. thing, so thank you to everybody that's willing. Thanks, Scott. Hey, uh, <clears throat> Phil, this is Matt Thomas. Uh, good to see you. You're looking uh, remarkably kimped in these COVID times. <laughs> thank uh, you, Matt. But uh, thanks, thanks for the presentation, and uh, we, we've certainly been enjoying the partnership with Inside and Phil for the last uh, almost half a decade, I guess now. And uh, I still remember when I first met Phil, I, I was sitting at his feet looking up, soaking in his wisdom. And uh, when I told him what we were planning on doing, he said, well, if, if you can make that happen, I'll believe it when I see it, because I've been wanting that for 30 years. And so we're happy that we were able to make his dreams come true. Uh, we, we too are trying to hit our uh, Q2 numbers. And so that, uh, that uh, special pricing there is uh, certainly um, extended from JP3 as well. Uh, Phil, thanks again. And I did want to mention that um, in addition to all the applications Phil's been talking about, we do a lot of downstream and distribution type applications as well, uh, including looking at refined fuels and transmix, um, eliminating transmix and saving uh, half a million to a million dollars a year at Transmix Terminals. We just signed an agreement with uh, Phil 66 that we announced uh, to go out and uh, market that across North America. So that's yet another application that we're uh, happy to be able to do with our data systems. Thanks again, Phil. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate it. No, it's been great. We've, uh, yes, as Matt said, we've had a pretty long, you know, five, at least a five or six year working relationship. Actually, I think I started consulting seven years ago with you guys. Um, and then as Insight, about five. So yeah, it's been great. Um, hey, Garth. Yeah, thanks. Old GC guy. I mean, uh, it was good seeing you, Garth. Thanks, buddy. Cool. Any other questions or anything? Sorry. No, go ahead. Chelsea. I should not be speaking over you. This is your party, Phil Harris. No worries. All right. Well, everybody else, we are here for the next little bit. So if you have any other, any, any other feedback for Phil, um, we'll make it really easy for you to find this information. We'll make sure to send out a little replay email to everybody that was here today um, with some links and some emails and um, some more things to check out. Thank you, everybody, so much for being here. You see Mr. Dival down there. Hi, Dale. Thanks, buddy. You know, the smiling face. That's yeah, cool because as people are leaving now, I get to see actually who's all here. Brian, Rose and Derek. Oh my God, Derek Rainwater's too. Derek, how you doing, buddy? How's things in Mississippi? Cool. All right, I have Louie, Ma, Nathan, and Doug. Dale, you can stick around for this too. Scotty, maybe Mark, Kevin. Um, if you're there, guys are at your computer. Uh, looks like a lot of Swage Lock guys left. Esteban is here. Um, then we just want to try a little thing with uh, using uh, um, breakout rooms in Zoom. So just want to see that we can. Chelsea just wants there's a little thing she wants to do here. So Thank we can help her out. Just so that you know, everybody's saying thank you in the chat. In case you can't see that, Phil. Yeah, for some reason my chat's not updating on here. Oh, great! Thanks so much, everybody. Yeah. Scroll. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. So yeah, it's, oh, hell, I can't even see that Alex Track was on here too. Yeah. Cool. Cool. All right, Chelsea, what are you gonna do to us? All right. So everybody that everybody that doesn't want to go, or everybody that wants to go, can you all please? swiftly leave and everybody that wants to stay to help me out thank you very 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 much if everybody though this is going to require you to put your cameras on sorry if that's a thing that you don't want to do then um maybe i suppose you have to leave us okay guys so thank you so much i um what i actually need to do 
is if everybody can put their cameras on for a sec. Thank you. Beautiful faces everywhere. Wonderful. Um, and you know what, guys? You don't actually have to. Not everybody needs to put their cameras on for this if they don't want to. Um, I just need to practice a couple little things here and get a couple more little promo um, picks off of this. So uh, if you don't want your video on, that's fine. I'm so just part of the reason for this is one of the things